Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Always a pleasure to be able to worship together. Um, Would you please join me as I pray? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Jesus, we come to hear from you today. I pray to God that you will remove every single obstacle in the spiritual realm or even in the natural that will act as a blockade to us being able to hear from you. I ask, dear God, that you will speak through me and that we will be receptive to the words that you are sharing with us today. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. Last week, Pastor Paula kicked off our current three-week sermon series um, on Lent. During this season on the church calendar, beginning on Ash Wednesday and ending on Easter weekend, many believers around the globe are intentionally engaging in a time of personal reflection to prepare our hearts and minds to remember Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday and to celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. The purpose of this time of reflective preparation is solely to draw us closer to God so that we can have a stronger, more fruitful relationship with him. And I believe that today, if we were to play a word association game to identify what comes to mind when we think of Lent, one of the top answers that would likely cross our minds or that would emerge would be the word fast or fasting. This is because one of the primary ways people seek to pursue more of Jesus in their lives during this Lenten season is through fasting or giving up certain things as a form of prayerful spiritual discipline and penance. This may include abstaining from certain foods and drinks, activities or habits in favor of pursuing more of Jesus through the Holy Holy Spirit's empowerment in our lives to help us to live more godly lives by embodying the teachings of Jesus that we find in the Bible. In my own spiritual journey, I've engaged in fasting for this reason on numerous occasions. And one fast really stands out. As many of you know, I'm a huge sports fan. I'm an avid sports fan. It's one of the first things that people think about when they think about me. And if you go on my social media, it's very evident. I love the Los Angeles Lakers. I love the New York Yankees. I am a fan of Aaron Rodgers, the player. Um, And so people think of me, they tend to know that I love sports. And as some of you know, I also love drinking lots of black coffee. Um, My favorite drink is a black Americano. So if you ever are just driving around the church during the week and you want to stop by and surprise me with something, it's totally within the Holy Spirit's direction in your life (laughs) to bring Prince a black Americano because I love it. And while my love for sports and coffee aren't bad or evil in and of themselves, A few years ago, I felt led by God to give up sports consumption on every level for 40 days and 40 nights. I gave up watching games. I did not read articles about sports. I did not check any scores. I did not listen to any sports podcasts or watch any sports shows. I didn't even engage in conversations in the gym or in the circles that I was walking in um, regarding sports because I really wanted to separate myself for a time. And looking back, what I find most interesting about this fast is that the Holy Spirit prompted me to start it on Super Bowl Sunday of that year. And if you know anything about sports or you're a sports fan, that's like, forgive my language, but this is like a high sacred day um, on the sports calendar for us. And so that's when I started it. I also felt God telling me, you know what, Prince, set aside the coffee for the 40 days and 40 nights as well. And the reason I separated myself from these things that I love for a time came from my desire to ensure that Jesus occupied the most important place in my heart. I didn't want anything or anyone to become an idol that would distract me from knowing Jesus more deeply. And if I was being honest, I I loved it a little bit too much. And so I, I I came before God saying, you know what? This is something that I care about. I get obsessed. I, get, I cry when we lose and all of that type of stuff. And I don't want to be that person. And so, God, please help me to have a proper alignment of what truly matters in my life. And when I reflect on the fast, I will admit that I miss the comfort of engaging with sports and drinking coffee. 
but I also experienced a strong sense of God's presence being with me. I sensed his spirit deepening my love for him, and I felt my heart expanding with greater care and empathy for people like I never experienced before. However, I also endured testing that came in the form of heightened temptations that were separate from the longings that I had to drink coffee or to watch games. These temptations came from opportunities to sin against God. It appeared as though people and circumstances were emerging out of everywhere, presenting me with opportunities to go against doing what God wants us to do in his word. I would go on social media and I would just be scrolling and looking for nothing and then, bam, an opportunity to sin. I would drive in the car and somebody would do something that would elicit anger in me and I was tempted to sin. Throughout that entire time, while I was sensing more of Jesus, I also sensed that there were more trials coming my way in the form of temptations. Perhaps you've been there before. If you're a follower of Jesus, I'm sure you have. There have likely been seasons in your faith journey when you have grown to love Jesus more through pursuing him more intently, then suddenly you find yourself in an intensified battle to resist temptations. You find yourself being tested. Now, if we can observe testing through various forms of temptation being typically present when we're pursuing more of Jesus in our lives, like many are during Lent, we need to ensure that we are prepared to face temptations when they come our way. We are a local church that says our vision is to pursue intimacy with God and impact for him. And so if we're going to pursue intimacy with God, we can expect that the enemy is going to try to stop it by allowing us to be tempted. So today we are addressing this question, how do we overcome temptation? How do we position ourselves through the Spirit's empowerment to follow the ways of God rather than following our own desires or temptations that may emerge in our lives? How do we overcome temptation? And we will answer this question by observing how Jesus responded to a period of testing that he faced in his early life and ministry. This account of Jesus being tempted is detailed in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, also known as the Synoptic Gospels, but we'll be focusing our attention on Luke's telling of this insightful story that is recorded in the first 13 verses of the book's fourth chapter. In saying that, in verses 1 and 2 of Luke 4, we read, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing at all at that time and became very hungry. There are a couple of key observations from these two verses that jump out to me that is important for us to clarify and unpack. Firstly, we should note that in the previous chapter, Luke 3, the author tells the account of Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River. That is why he writes, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. This helps us to know what just happened or occurred in Jesus' earthly life before he endured a period of testing. He had the significant moment where he was affirmed, where he publicly declared his allegiance to his father, and then he endured testing. Secondly, by letting us know that Jesus was full of the Spirit and led by the same Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil, Luke makes it clear that the testing that Jesus faced took place on the divine direction. God did not tempt him because the scriptures teach us in the book of James that God cannot be tempted to do evil, nor does he tempt anyone else to do evil. However, it is also evident and clear throughout the Bible, through numerous examples, that, that God does allow people to be tested to see if we will respond with faithfulness to him or if we will act in how we determine is the right way for us to live with disobedience. For Jesus, the testing of period of his character in this instance took place in the wilderness. And when we read or see the word wilderness in the Bible, from a literal point of view, we should envision a desert or a desolate place that is tough to endure. 
Figuratively speaking, we should imagine a difficult season in someone's life marked by discomfort and trials. So a des when you think about the wilderness, think of a desert, a des desolate place that is tough to endure, or figuratively speaking, a tough season in someone's life where discomfort is there and where trials are many. And in our passage today, Jesus was believed to be in a literal and physical wilderness and a figurative one as well for 40 days and 40 nights. The number 40 appears in scripture in many contexts. At, time, at times, 40 just means literally the number 40, like 40 years or 40 items of a thing or 40 days. However, the number often symbolizes seasons of testing and hardship as well. We see this in the Old Testament accounts of the people of Israel who, in leaving Egypt, experienced a baptismal-like miraculous deliverance through being brought through the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds and the elation of having a mountaintop experience of finally being free from Egyptian slavery was followed by a wilderness experience for God's chosen people. During Israel's years in the desert, God tested the nation on multiple occasions. These tests came in the forms of opportunities for the Israelites to demonstrate whether they would trust God and his word and his wisdom or whether they would give in to the temptation to do what was good in their own eyes. Sometimes Israel's tests arrive in the form of a total lack of resources to meet their needs. Other times, Israel's tests came from enemies who wanted to kill them and to destroy them. Sadly, the scripture lets us know that many in the nation of Israel were unable to overcome their testing. As a result, they endured a 40-year journey of hardship while wandering in the wilderness because of the unfaithfulness to God. On the other hand, Jesus, after he emerged from the waters of baptism at the Jordan River and was led by God in the wilderness for 40 days while he fasted, faced opposition from the enemy of our souls. Luke tells us that the devil himself was the orchestrator of the temptations that Jesus faced. Our Savior engaged in a battle with Satan or the devil, who is a real being who epitomizes evil and who always seeks to destroy God's people. His purpose is to defeat God's people and to destroy God's purposes in the world. And he primarily does this by using deceptive tactics that are set up to cause us to be destroyed, killed, and to rob us of everything that God has in plan for our lives. And the tactic that the devil used while tempting Jesus focused on taking aim as his identity as the Son of God. He focused on Jesus' identity as the Son of God. We would recall that while Jesus was being baptized, a voice from heaven said to him, You are my Son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. And in opposition to God's affirmative statement of fact spoken over his only begotten son, the devil builds his strategic approach of tempting Jesus around the hypothetical phrase, if you are the son of God, then perform a series of requested actions. The pressing issue in the passage today is, who is Jesus? Is he really the son of God? And you know what? This is how the enemy deceptively attacks you and I as well. The pressing issue that we face in our lives is the temptation to wrongly build our identity on or around something other than the identity God established for us as his created beings in his image who were made to worship him in spirit and in truth. Our enemy knows if he can trick us through wooing us to give in to temptations to embrace something or someone that has the potential to rival our commitment to Jesus, the entirety of our lives has the potential to be destroyed. He knows that if he can get us to see our lives outside of the prism that God has set up for us to view it from, he can snatch the most important thing in our lives away from us, which is a relationship with God, and that is how we experience actual flourishing. The devil knows our thoughts concerning who we are determines our actions. This is why he aims to undermine our identity. 
because he knows, as Tim Keller wisely wrote, sin is the despairing refusal to find our deepest identity in our relationship and service to God. So we shouldn't be surprised to us when we face testing concerning the way we view ourselves and our placement in the world. As it has been the enemy's strategy to destroy humankind from the beginning. Adam and Eve were told that if they did something, that is, partake of the tree of the, of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they would achieve God-like status. That, as we know, was a bold-faced lie. God had already made them in his image and his likeness. They were not God, but they had attributes of God that they could share. But they gave in to the temptation by embracing a satanic lie of a false identity which had dire consequences for humanity. In the case of Jesus, the devil aimed to attack his identity as God's son by testing him with three temptations. We're going to firstly unpack the three temptations today, and then we will address how we overcome them in later on in the sermon. With that said, in Luke 4, 3, we read, Then the devil said to him, If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. This first temptation the enemy presents to Jesus sought to question God's ability to provide and care for his people or his son. It is believed that the devil's underlying premise in this instance of testing is that Jesus' identity as the Son of God must mean that God does not want his son to starve in the wilderness. So Jesus, who is hungry because of his fast, should use his divine power to turn stone into bread and satisfy his basic physical need in his own strength. After all, he was fully God and fully man. The devil's temptation to Jesus aimed to see if his bodily essential needs for food outweighed his need to be in right relationship with his father. In a similar way, we too face the temptation or the testing directed at our perceived physical needs. Temptations in this era of our lives place us in a position to determine if we will gratify our bodily needs at the cost of our commitment to God. Our needs for love, our need for companionship, provision, and rest, among other things, have the potential to compete with the prominence God plays in our lives. And the reality is, many essential things that become temptations are not bad for us. They're actually good. For instance, physical intimacy is good in the right circumstances. It is a gift to be enjoyed by a husband and a wife in marriage. Similarly, working hard to earn money to provide for our families is good. And having food to sustain our lives is good. But if we pursue these things in a manner that causes them to become idols in our lives and to take first place in our lives, they have the potential to unravel our lives. We all can think of people who have a beautiful family, but they're so obsessed with work, they're workaholics, and a result of that, they have placed something that is good in an inappropriate position, and they've allowed the temptation to pursue gratification by earning things in this life, and as a result of that, their family is being destroyed. The point is, Good things become bad in our lives when they're twisted in our eyes so that we believe that they're more important than our relationship with God. And when we build our identities, who we see ourselves as, around them. Now let's look at the second temptation that the devil threw at Jesus. In verses 5 to 7 of our text, it says, Then the devil took him took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they're mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all, I will give it all to you if you will worship me. The devil who is described in the Bible as the ruler of the world in the Gospel of John and the prince of the air, rule of this world in the Gospel of John, and the prince of the air in Ephesians, was believed to possess a measure of authority in our world before Jesus' incarnation and his atoning work on the cross and his resurrection defeated him. It is believed that the devil got this authority because of our sinfulness, which went back to the sinfulness of Adam and Eve. 
And it is with this backdrop of perceived power in mind that the enemy sought to test Jesus by tempting him through a vision. The devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and promised to grant him authority over them if Jesus worshipped him. The temptation here is an invitation for the Son of God to abandon loyalty to his Father by aligning himself with the evil one and ascribing glory to someone other than God. And if Jesus succumbed to this test, he would have chosen to reject the cup of suffering that the Father wanted him to partake of to redeem humanity, and he would forfeit his right to receive eternal glory, everlasting glory, as God's true one eternal son. At first glance, this temptation may not seem applicable to us, because the truth is, you and I are likely to never be in a position where we have a vision, where we see all the kingdoms of the world, and Satan says to us, if you worship me, then I will give you one of those kingdoms to have authority over. It's highly unlikely. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm using the word unlikely. And so even though it may seem unapplicable to us, it is more applicable than we can think about in first glance. Because we consistently face the temptation to engage in idolatry over and over again. Perhaps in our context, we are tempted to worship our perceived influence on social media, where we are just so obsessed with everyone assuming that our life's meaning comes from the amount of followers and likes that we get, that we end up worshiping ourselves, and we ended up worshiping all these people's perception of us in a negative way. Or perhaps we worship our possessions, the things that we can acquire in this world, the size of our homes, the type of vehicles we drive, the size of our bank accounts. That may be what we are tempted to engage in idolatry over. Perhaps it's our family. This one seems very relevant to me because I understand it. I never got it before. I always wondered, like, why, why do people, why are you so obsessed with your kids? And then I had one. <laughs> and then I realized this is a real temptation. And so that is something that we do face as well. Or, and we always have the, the temptation or the desire to give worship or to ascribe glory to unsustainable items that stand in the way of God and living into our identities as his loved children. There's also another side of this temptation that the enemy faced that we should be, pay attention to that is relevant for us. Maybe you and I are tempted to outrightly abandon God's call in us to be on mission for him in our circles of influence. Because there's a perception that many people in our society today are hostile towards Christianity. So rather than enduring potential rejection by publicly making it known what we believe and who we believe in, we take the easy road by hiding our faith from people who need to be introduced to or reminded of Jesus' love the most. Remember I mentioned that for Jesus, the enemy wanted him to take on one of these worldly kingdoms by worshiping him. And by doing that, Jesus would have been saying, hey, I am rejecting the call and the reason of my incarnation, which is to come into this world to save humanity and the created order from the sinfulness that has held them captive. So he would have potentially be rejected, rejecting rather his purpose. And we too sometimes face this rejection of the purpose and the mandate that God has placed in our lives. We say to ourselves, you know what? In the Great Commission, Jesus said, I want you to go out into all the world and to make disciples of all men and women, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the temptation that many people who are engaged in church, who are not doing what I do from this standpoint, even people who do what I do have this temptation as well, we think that someone else who is gifted with evangelism should be the one that is engaging in this work of spreading the gospel message. But the reality is we fail to recognize that evangelism in and of itself is a team effort. Some of us go out and invite. Some of us preach the message. Some of us counsel and disciple afterwards. And so by rejecting our calling as followers of Jesus to be engaged in the work of spreading the gospel message, we are potentially falling prey to the temptation of abandoning the thing that Jesus laid before us when he commissioned his church into existence. This is one of the temptations that we face. Alongside idolatry, alongside the temptation to find provision through our own strength, we face the temptation to reject or avoid our purpose. The third and final temptation that Jesus faced from the devil while in the wilderness was this. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, 
If you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt a foot on a stone. Just like the second temptation that came to Jesus, this one was also a vision. This time he was taken to the temple in Jerusalem, and some scholars and theologians believe that this vision that Jesus was taken to a royal, the royal porch on the temple, which loomed over a cliff and the Kidron Valley, which was about 450 feet below. So jumping from such a height and surviving would require divine intervention. To amplify this temptation, the devil also engages in twisting of scripture. He quotes Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12, a text that promises, that has a promise from God that says that he will protect his own. The idea behind the enemy's deceptive tactics here is this. If God protects his own and Jesus is his son, then Jesus can jump and not worry. Jesus can run over the edge and not be crushed because God will surely not cause pain and suffering to come upon his only begotten son. The devil aimed to jeopardize Jesus' identity by having him test his father's commitment to him rather than truly trusting his father. The enemy wanted Jesus to question whether the father was with him or not, because after all, he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights facing immense hardships, so and maybe he may even be thinking to himself, am I alone? So the enemy wanted to play upon this. Like Jesus, we sometimes endure seasons that are incredibly difficult. We suffer. As imperfect people, we sin. We let each other down. Life can be painful. It can be difficult. It can be disappointed. So we often are led to ask, why has God brought me to this place? Why, I am, why am I in this position? Why am I here? These wilderness circumstances emerging in our lives tempt us to question God's commitment to us. And our questioning sometimes leads us to testing God. It is important for us to understand, because I don't want us to have any disillusions about what it actually means to test God, because we should go to God prayerfully expecting him to perform miracles, and we should be able to lament our frustrations and vent to him. But that's not what testing God's means. To test God is to insist that he prove his trustworthiness to us. To test God is to look at our difficulties and say, a loving God would never let me suffer in this way. Maybe if things get better, then I can trust him. To test God is to ask with a sense of entitlement, as the Israelites did in their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, is God with us or not? Flippantly saying, hey, God, are you here? That's what we do when we test him. We are questioning whether or not he's truly committed to us in an incise, with, an intent, with an entitlement spirit. This temptation to test God alongside the temptation to engage in idolatry, purpose avoidance, and self-reliance are consistent threats we face as believers to destroy our relationship with God and how we view ourselves as people found in Christ. And as Jesus demonstrates in our passage today, we overcome these temptations by fully embracing the truths found in God's word as our hope. When Jesus was tempted by the devil to prove his sonship by exhibiting his power to provide for his physical needs, apart from trusting in his father, he was asked to turn stone into bread. And the son of God told the enemy, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone. When Jesus was tempted by the evil one to reject his purpose of the incarnation and the purpose of, of saving humanity through suffering by engaging in idolatry to potentially worship the one who is the epitome of evil, this is what he said. The scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And when Jesus was tempted by the devil to test his father's commitment and loyalty to him as his loved son through the enemy's subtle twisting of scripture, he responded, the scriptures say, you must not test the Lord your God. We notice on all three occasions of being tempted in the wilderness by the enemy that Jesus relied on God's word as his defense to overcome the attacks that came his way. In fact, 
In every instance, he quoted specifically from Deuteronomy chapters 6 to 8. And this Old Testament textual unit refers to the wilderness experience of the people of Israel. So we can observe that Jesus relied on the truths God revealed to the Israelites in the wilderness to come overcome his wilderness testing. Jesus contextually applied scripture to his circumstances. This, my friends, must be our approach that we take as well. We need to contextually trust and apply God's word to our temptations. We do this by purposefully internalizing scriptural truth in our lives to help us overcome the spiritual trials that come our way. There is no shortcut in this process. We must be wise to recognize the temptation presented before us through the Spirit's empowerment. Then we must respond by applying contextualized biblical truth to help us to resist the enemy's attacks. So if you're in a season right now where you're being tempted intensely to meet your essential needs on your own, if you're being tempted to engage in idolatry, idolatry, purpose rejection, and the circumstances in your life are leading you to want to put God to the test in a sinful manner, I encourage you, no, I implore you, to ask the Spirit of Jesus to help you to grow in your capacity to study and internalize scriptural truths that are applicable to the spiritual battles that you are fighting to help you to overcome it. From a practical level, if it's a physical need that you are struggling to find hope in and you're elevating into a position of above God in your life, look for scriptures that speak to that circumstance. Internalize it. And when the enemy attacks you with that, or if you find that temptation emerging in your lives, speak forth those words to that temptation when the enemy is seeking to destroy you in that manner. That is the model that our Lord and Savior Jesus said. And we should do the same. The scripture says, thy word, have, th th thy word have I hidden in my heart, for when the evil time comes that I will not sin against thee. This is what we read about in scripture. And you know what happens as we commit to digging deeper into the Bible? God helps us to grow in our understanding of the gospel. And the good news of Jesus is that he endured life's temptations in our place. So in our testing, we must flee and run to him. He conquered the adversary. He defeated the devil. He tore down the walls of evil around us, for us. He stands in our place to defeat temptation that often defeats us. He endured a wilderness experience to be our source of hope because when he went through his wilderness experiences, he did not sin against God. The scripture says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus was tempted in every way that you and I are tempted, yet he did not sin. And right now, he reigns in the heavens as God's beloved son who can empathize and sympathize with our weaknesses. And he makes it possible for us to approach the Father through the Spirit with boldness to receive help in our time of need because he is our deliverer. As we study scripture, we learn the gospel. And the gospel tells us that Jesus is the one that we run to when we are facing temptation. There's always an element of fleeing when temptation comes. We look at the example of Joseph when Potiphar wife, Potiphar's wife approached him in, in a manner to lead him to have sexual intercourse with her. He ran away. That is the posture that we have. We learn from Scripture. We run to Jesus. He is the defender of our faith. He has fought. He has torn down every single thing that we face in our lives. That is our hope. I love the way that John Owen frames this relevant truth for Christians in every generation. The English theologian once wrote, a believer is oftentimes at the very brink, at the very door of some folly or iniquity. When God puts in by the efficacy of actually assisting grace and recovers them to an obediential frame of heart again, and this is a peculiar work of Christ, wherein, wherein he manifests and exerts his faithfulness towards his own. He is able to help them that are tempted. Here lies a great part of the care and faithfulness of Christ towards his poor saints. You and I are the poor saints. We face temptations all the time. We are tested on every side. The enemy wants to destroy our identity as people who are loved by God and adopted into his family. 
and he will use a myriad of tactics to destroy our relationship with him. And the way we overcome that is getting help from the one who faced every single temptation that life has for us. And one way that we can turn to Jesus is by speaking his name into our circumstances. As our dear friend Stacy, who we'll always miss and love and remember, reminded us when she prophetically sang Charity Gill's worship song, I Speak Jesus, which invites us to declare Jesus' name in every situation, but especially when we're in the wilderness, because we find power to overcome testing through the one who has broken every single struggle. So today, if your temptation that the enemy is throwing at you is something that says you need to put your physical needs in your life above everything else, speak the name of Jesus to that. If the temptation that you're facing is self-reliance and you're looking to engage with the ability to, for you to power up and to find hope, speak the name of Jesus into that situation. If for you it's idolatry, you know what is causing you to say, hey, I'm going to worship this thing. Speak the name of Jesus into that situation. If for you, you want, you have been tempted to avoid God's call on your life, say in Jesus' name, I reject that lie of the enemy. I will fulfill God's calling on my life and I will go forward to step into the purposes that he has laid out for me. Speak the name of Jesus into that circumstance. If you are being tempted to test God in a manner that is sinful, speak the name of Jesus into that circumstance. That is how we overcome. So right now, our worship team is going to lead us into a singing of this song. I invite you all to stand right now at this time, and I invite you to declare these words and think about the situation that you are facing in your life. What is the temptation that the enemy, what is the test that the enemy is seeking to use to destroy you? Declare these words and think about that circumstance and ask the Holy Spirit to have Jesus step into that situation in a manner that causes it to be destroyed because he has defeated everything. Pacific, it's time for us to step forward into boldness to declare who Jesus is with power and passion and with no fear. And so today... Speak forth his name and as we sing this powerful song. Amen. <laughs>